Hello, everybody, and welcome to our talk on differentiable programming in C++. My name is Vasil Vasilev, and I'm a research software engineer with Princeton, and this is William Moses, a PhD candidate with MIT. In this talk, we'll be talking about using both math, compilers, and ISO CPT. So let's get started. This is a pre-recorded talk, and we would like to answer questions at the end. Please use the Zoom system to ask any question you would like at your convenience and we will make sure it gets answered. The rest of this talk is organized in the following way. Since this is the first talk in the session, we have prepared a little warm-up. Then we will make an introduction on about how we compute derivatives and what are the approaches. Then we will make a gentle introduction to automatic differentiation and the chain rule. Uh, we will see some applications of automatic differentiation. Then we will see what differentiable programming is, uh, take a look a little bit on deep learning and automatic differentiation. We will see uh, how back propagation works. Uh, we will talk about existing tools and frameworks, and we will talk about implementation. We would discuss possible implementation approaches of automatic differentiation. We want to showcase tools that were built as part of the LVM and Clang compiler tool chain. Uh, we want to explain how such tools work and what are the benefits. Uh, we briefly outline our standardization efforts and we conclude. Uh, before anything else, let's warm up a little bit. Uh, you can probably recognize this face. This is Usain Bolt, a retired Jamaican sprinter, widely considered to be the greatest printer of all times. He is the world record holder in a uh, sprint of 100 meters, 200 meters, and four times 100 meter relay. Bolt improved upon his second 100 meter world record of 9.69 with 9.68 seconds in 2009. And that is the biggest improvement since the start of the electronic timing. Uh, he has also broken twice the 200 meters world record, but how fast did he run? And what that even means? The usual way to compute the derivative, uh, the usual way to compute the average speed is to divide the displacement and the time. Here we get 100 meters divided by 9.58, uh, which approximately equals to 30.57 kilometers per hour or a little more than 23 miles per hour. Uh, but what we what if we want to know more details about, uh, for example, did he accelerate until the end? Did he slow down? What was his top speed? These questions are interesting because uh, we can understand better how uh, he achieved this remarkable result. Some of the future, uh, some of the some go further in measuring a speed of wind his step size and posture, all useful information to improve in future. Uh, Bolt's run is a continuous process. However, we could get insights about it by measuring several aspects. For example, we can measure the total time at a given distance, and such data is actually available in many sports-related sources. For instance, sportsendurance.com shares both timings every 10 meters. These measurements allow us to build some intuition about the process. We can use basic math to understand if he run every 10 meters at the same speed. For example, where we can find the velocity at some interval. We could also calculate and show the gradient graph at, at the time. We can see that both run with the same velocity between the 50th and the 80th meter by subtracting 80 and 50 over 7.96 and 5.5, .5, which is around 12.19 meters per, which is 12.19 meters per second. This tells us about the rate of change between the 50th and the 80th meter, and it was zero. Um, this way we can reason about other properties of the run, such as velocity, acceleration, and distance. So given the data from 2008 in the role. Is it obvious that he could have done better? Maybe. Um, for this particular case, we have the hints provided by television and photos. Looking at the videos, 
and his gestures, it seems that he celebrated before the finish line. And also a careful observer would notice that maybe he can do a better Sule job. If we compute the rate of change of the displacement over time, we will see that the graph of the velocity. We can notice that both velocity at the point close to zero was four meters per second. That is his first couple of steps. And then it peaked around 12 meters per second. We can notice that in 2008, the velocity went quite drastically down. This happened around the 80th meter, which was the critical point, and it continued to drop until the end. The rate of change of the velocity with respect to time is the acceleration. Here we can see that in 2008, this acceleration peaked in the 20th meter, and then it went up and down by not a significant margin until the critical point. What is interesting to see here is that in 2009, which is the year of the, his unbeaten uh, world record, he decelerated. In fact, he lost 0, 0.0 seconds in the first three seconds, or around the first 30 meters of the run. If he did not decelerate in 2008 that drastically, it is very likely that the best human time of a 100 meter dash would have been 9.51, 9.52. And that timing was confirmed to be achievable for that individual by his coach in various interviews. So the derivative is of a function f is uh, measuring the rate of change of its input or how sensitive the output of the function is with respect to a given input. Short runs usually have more parameters than just velocity and acceleration, such as weather conditions. However, the process is very quick and there is little room to make changes to optimize performance once the process started. Usually, all preparatory work is done ahead of time. The longer distance runs are different. They are influenced by more aspects and they are with longer dura duration. So people can implement tactics or winning strategies. Teams usually employ tactics that allow individuals to effectively use their talent and skill to their best possible advantage. Typically, that means there is a plan or a reference trajectory which should be followed and adapted towards observed changes during the process. Until recently, teams relied on building some intuition through experience, but recent years, successful teams have substantial science teams. For example, Teams started involving pacers or pacemakers to ensure if they follow the optimal trajectory, either to break a record or to avoid deception. Usually, the front runner's energy is kept until the right time by team runners ensuring better aerodynamics. Rarely, the front runner of a team leads a column in the first stages of a race. These and other pro uh, processes are complex and depend on multiple variables. Each variable contributes to the overall output performance. Tuning each variable to maximize output while minimizing cost is a very common success technique. The gradient descent method is an approach to tune many input parameters, taking into account how uh, each input influences the final output by re relying on information about how rate changes off the input parameter and changes the output parameter. The gradient descent optimization relies on gradients that is a vector of derivatives with respect to each input variable. This gradient descent vector can be interpreted as a direction and the rate of the fastest increase or decrease. In essence, it makes steps towards a direction, reassesses whether it is still on the right path, and continues. There are multiple implementations, as you can see here, uh, of that approach. Here, interactively, is the comparison between several different approaches and how quickly they converge towards the minimum. Uh, we have warmed up a little on what, me, uh, what is the meaning uh, of a derivative and a gradient. Let's talk a little bit more about how to compute them with machines. There are several ways to compute a derivative with a computer. The manual way uh, assumes derivation by hand and it's tedious and error-prone process. In that case, if the initial function changes, we need to remember to invalidate the derivative and manually derive it again. 
The menu derivation usually assumes derivation of mass expression in the math domain and translating it to code. It's virtually impossible to manually derive an algorithm because of its multi-level dependencies. The numerical approach or the divided or finite differentiation is a numerical method to approximate the derivative. Its implementation quickly reaches the limitations of the machine epsilon and it has floating point representation issues. Usually the algorithm can compute the derivative with a user-defined precision. This includes iterating and poses problems in convergence. Another problem for this method is that it is hard to find good perturbation with the right trade-off between maintaining numerical stability and accuracy. Third way is symbolic differentiation. It is a method for automatically applying the chain rule of mathematical functions. This is, uh, this is the approach implemented in languages such as mathematical or MAPL. It is limited to closed form expressions. That is, it cannot handle control flow. And automatic differentiation, finally, is a set of methods that allow us to efficiently differentiate algorithms as opposed to just mathematical function in the symbolic differentiation. This talk intensively focuses on the method and what it enables. The numerical differentiation uses the approach of finite differences. Following the mathematical formula as we, uh, shown as we have shown before, the idea is to compute the function at the point x and subtract a near point x plus h, where h is a very small value, and divided by h. The problem with this approach is the choice of h. It is problem dependent. If we take too big step h, the approximation to the actual derivative becomes too poor as we can see from the plot above. In red is a tangent line and in black is our approximation. If the step is too small, the floating point running of error becomes too large due to the machine representation. And it is shown in the figure here. Last but not least, the evaluation complexity of the derivative depends of, on the input parameters of the function. That is, if f takes 100 parameters, and we'll need, one, uh, we'll need 101 function calls. Other numerical approaches make even more calls in effort to stabilize the result and achieve better approximation. performance and approximation. The symbolic differentiation is limited to closed form expressions. That is, we cannot have control flow. Uh, in the example on the right hand side, one can differentiate symbolically the function uh, above uh, but not its semantic equivalent below. Uh, this approach requires symbolic processing and requires transcribing back the result into an algorithm. In many cases, the original function is not available in analytic form. It may even be modified with performance considerations or to fit computer architectures. This makes symbolic differentiation quite hard to use in existing systems and algorithms. And just like uh, in the numerical differentiation, computing higher order derivatives is problematic. This time mostly due to the so-called expression swell, where the higher order derivative sub-expressions become large and simplification is hard. Automatic differentiation, on, on the other hand, exploits the fact that every computer program can be decomposed to a set of elementary arithmetic operations, such as addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication, and in elementary functions, such as exp, log, sine, and cosine, uh, whose analytical derivatives are known from the differential calculus. Automatic differentiation is known as algorithmic differentiation, autodiff, algodiff, and computational differentiation. This technology is perhaps one of the most rediscovered ideas. Forward mode is equivalent to the dual number algebra introduced in 19th century. Reverse mode is known since 1960s and it is used to estimate rounding errors of an algorithm and now it's reinvented as backpropagation. Automatic differentiation and symbolic differentiation are often confused. Unlike symbolic systems, uh, the automatic differentiation method includes rules to efficiently differentiate sequences of instructions, exploiting the existing code structure to optimize the use of intermediate variables and control flow. Consider the following example, maybe a, a pathological example. It is useful to show in succinct the general idea. 
Here, function f accumulates exponential. The analytical derivative is not easy to guess, at least not for me. And it is e to the 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 x. If we want to differentiate this algorithm, we should put that example in a symbolic system and get something quite hard to understand. Then we should transcribe it back to a derivative in an algorithm. I should say that it would take me some time to converge to the algorithm of dx given the analytical, analytical above. Uh, Note that control flow of f, any control flow in f, would make that process much harder. On the other hand, automatic differentiation would take an algorithm and automatically create the first order derivative, but also, if necessary, the nth order derivative. In the next couple of slides, we would like to briefly explain how this works for automatic differentiation. Automatic differentiation relies on a rule known in math as the chain rule. Let's build an intuition about it. The chain rule tells us that if we know the instantaneous rate of change of z relative to y and y relative to x, we can calculate the instantaneous change of z relative to x as the product of the two. In the other words, as George Simmons explain, explains it, if a car travels twice as fast as a bike and a bike is four times faster than a walking man, then the car travels two times four equals eight times faster than the man. This simple yet very powerful concept is useful for, from an algorithmic point of view. Let's consider the following pseudocode. Uh, y equals f of x and z equals uh, g of y. Let's assume that we know the derivative of f of x with respect to x and g of y with respect to y. And we are interested in the derivative of the output z with respect to x. We can compute it by applying the chain rule, which is the derivative of g y with respect to y multiplied with the derivative of f x with respect to x. We can recursively apply this until we reach elementary operations such as multiplication, addition, subtraction, division, sinus, cosinus, and, uh, or exponent. I find it useful to think about this process in terms of graph connectivity. We can create the following computational graph, uh, which represents the variable dependencies. The nodes are the variables and the edges are the derivatives between adjacent variables. In practice, functions can have many uh, input and output parameters. Let's enhance a little bit our example. Our function f now takes two inputs, x0 and x1, and, and z has two outputs, w0 and w1. Let's draw the computational graph. We can notice that there are multiple paths to reach two w0 and w1. The, the green arrows outline one such path. It tells us that the rate of change of w0 depends on the rate of change of z and y. No, notionally, we can express it by that, uh, by that formula. This expression captures the transition between the variables, the rate of change of w0 with respect to z, multiplied by the rate of change of z with respect to y, and multiplied by the rate of change of y with respect to x0. Uh, In the same manner, we can construct the path for uh, w0 uh, and x1. And similarly, for the output for w1, usually to compute how sensitive a function is, we require the gradient vector, that is all four partial derivatives from this example. One can notice that there is a lot of common subpaths which can be computed only once for all partial derivatives, and we will come to that later. There are different ways to traverse that graph. And we will start from the most straightforward one, the forward mode automatic differentiation algorithm. We accumulate the partial derivatives starting from x0 and x1. Then we start with dx0, dx, and dx1, dx, which are both set to 1. Um, as we go, we continue to accumulate, accumulate um, dy, dx, and then dx, dz, dx. And finally, we push forward the dw0 dx and dw1 dx. 
The time complexity of this algorithm is O of n of the functions of the func of the original function, where n is the number of input parameters. The algorithm is useful for functions with small amount of input parameters and large amount of output out output values. Uh, many applications use use thousands of input variables, and the forward mode algorithm is invisible to use. There is the reverse mode algorithm. We accumulate the partial derivatives starting from the outputs, that is w0 and w1. Uh, as such, reverse mode is more efficient and has less outputs uh, when we have less outputs and many inputs. In fact, it is its time complexity does not depend on the number of inputs. The reverse mode AD is harder to implement. It needs to run the function essentially in reversely to propagate the partial derivatives. Uh, let's go over it. We start again with this time dw dw0 and dw dw1, and they are set to b1. Then we propagate back to dw dwz. Then we propagate to dw dy. And finally, we propagate back to dw dw x0 and dw dx1. And this is how the reverse mode algorithm works. Since we work with algorithms, um, control flow in forward mode is trivial to implement, including loops and iteration and recursion. Extra work is required for reverse mode to support recursion and control flow. Let's come back to our original example for computing the exponential function. The reverse mode requires the intermediate results for x of result. To solve this, we need to record the intermediate values in the forward pass and uh, of the function and then use it. The general strategy for transforming loops in reverse mode is to push the intermediate variables into a stack for each loop, then pop the items during the reverse loop. Nested loops can be handled in the same way for efficient code generation, dependency analysis is often required to push only the variables that will be used later on the stack. We can notice that while the algorithm is efficient in time complexity, it is not efficient in memory complexity. Since the memory usage depends on the number of instructions uh, or the length of the loops. Usually, the checkpoint optimization is used to reuse the memory. It is an optimization which pushes some of the intermediaries and others are left to be recomputed again. To recap, automatic differentiation uh, uses the properties of the chain rule and common subgraph and common path and common graph subpaths to efficiently compute derivatives. Forward mode is good for functions that have many outputs and less inputs, and reverse mode is good for functions that have many inputs and less outputs. Automatic differentiation is capable of producing cheap gradients whose time complexity is independent on the number on the number of inputs. The first uh, automatic differentiation uh, conference, to our knowledge, is, is held in the early 1990s, but tools have been developed since the early 1980s. During that time, there were many uses in various science domains and fluid dynamics, engineering, optimal control, and uh, climate and medicine. Let's uh, briefly take a look at what uh, and how IE automatic differentiation relates to differentiable programming. Deep learning has been an important factor in science and industry since years now. Deep learning algorithms are practically everywhere around us. We use deep learning to, def to generate faces of people that never existed. We can colorize uh, black and white pictures and movies. We can add sounds to movies. Um, we use deep learning to improve the diagnostics in medicine, 
deep learning recognizes our speech and handwriting and drives our cars automatically. Consider the following network. We use training data, uh, such, uh, such a product is called supervised learning. We send our training data signals through the network and we receive some output. We compare the output to the reference to our reference and we send signals back how it was uh, how good it was. We repeat that multiple times so the neurons can learn. At each iteration, they work to produce a result. Then they receive instructions how they should adjust their work. After neurons learned enough, we can send uh, to them the actual data and that we want to predict the output to. Sending information about the deviation from the desired output is called backpropagation. Let's take a look at how this slightly more complicated setup works. We have several hidden layers uh, and an error E. The way, the way how the backpropagation algorithm works is for X1 is the following. The partial derivative of E with respect to W11 of uh, layer one is equal to the contribution of the connected graph marked in red. Uh, then we see that we get the partial derivatives of E1 of the third layer uh, with respect to A1 of the second layer, then uh, A1 of the second layer with respect to Z1 of the second layer, then we go on with Z1 of the second layer and A1 of the first layer, and then we iterate over the other path that is uh, that we can reach for the partial derivatives, and then we multiply by the uh, a1 uh, of the first layer with respect to Z1 of the first layer, and then we have our error correction signal quantified. This algorithm matches closely our dry run in reverse mode, AD. Automatic differentiation is essential for deep learning and machine learning in general, and many of the recent advancements in the automatic differentiation came from the machine learning community. The differential programming is uh, a paradigm which a computer program can be differentiated throughout automatic differentiation. Deep learning drives the recent advancements in automatic differentiation. However, automatic differentiation is used for Bayesian interference, uncertainty quantification, modeling and simulation, and in many other science uh, domains of engineering. Um, several programming languages and frameworks have enabled the differential programming paradigm. Some languages such as uh, Swift and Julia and Kotlin made automatic differentiation first class citizen. The paradigm, the, automatic, the differential programming paradigm enables organizing software of the systems to become more sensitive to data. That is to be configured towards a particular data set and improve their efficiency towards concrete uh, data inputs which are fed to the system. Some researchers see that as a generalization of the deep learning where each layer is differentiable and describes a process algorithmically. Such layer can be considered as a software building block and layers can be combined and their sensitivity can be tuned using automatic differentiation towards a desired goal. That may enable us to define software in a more abstract and goal-driven way. For example, we may be able to describe the behavior of a program by providing an initial data set for inputs and outputs and define a goal such as win a game of Go. And now we will dive a little bit more in the practical side of automatic differentiation in C++ with uh, Mr. Moses. Having learned a lot about automatic differentiation previously, how it's useful and how other frameworks might go about it, let's talk about C++ and automatic differentiation since after all, this is CPP time. As said by Chris Rokakis, one of the most important things about scientific ML is if there's just one part of your entire network or one part of your entire program that isn't AD compatible or differentiable, then you can't actually train your network. So let's imagine we have this hypothetical little thing on the right where we have some input layer, we have some Python code, we have some C++ code, we have some Swift code, and we combine the three results of those and we produce our final output. So we can compute the forward pass or equivalently the original function perfectly fine, but without automatic differentiation within C++, we can backpropagate the derivative out of the output into both Python and Swift, 
but we can't do that into the C++ code, meaning whatever contribution that C++ code made to the final output, we aren't able to take that into account. As a consequence of this rather limited support for C++ automatic differentiation, it really hinders the use of C++ within the machine learning community, namely because if you can't very nicely do AD through it, then it means you can't go train your stuff. Also, more importantly, it means that anyone who wants to use the wide arrays of different C++ code bases, be it an existing simulator or whatever else, you can't use it as a layer otherwise inside of a new ML application. So, for example, one of the recent advances is to say, let's go take a render, for instance, or let's go take a new sort of model. Let's just put it as a layer of our neural network. And that works great for languages with first class support for automatic differentiation, be it Swift or Julia, but it means that we can't access all of that huge quantity of existing C++ code and use it inside of machine learning. So if we were to design from scratch the perfect C++ AD tool, these are roughly the bolts that we came up with of things that we'd really want to see inside of it. So first of all, obviously we want it to be fast. This comes in two places. So first of all, we want it to be fast to compile. Ideally, in particular, it's not a just-in-time compilation sort of process. And then two, it's also fast to go ahead and run. We want to make sure that it works on existing code. So we don't have to go and take our existing model and rewrite all of it to be inside of this C++ AD compatible subset of the language or use this AD compatible C++ library that we've written. To that end, we also want to not just make sure that we don't have to rewrite existing code, but we want to make sure it supports most of C++, so be it classes, templates, very crazy things with constructors and destructors. We want to make sure that the majority of the C++ surface is covered. So then you don't go ahead and hit an edge case where, oh, we don't handle operator overloading. And then the entire thing fails. And then the last of these is more of a standards focused sort of one, which is we want it to be easily maintainable. So ideally, um, you don't have to go ahead as like a library maintainer, or for instance, the C++ standard library or standard template library, you don't have to go rewrite all of this to be able to say every single one of these functions has their own particular rule, or every one of these things needs to understand AD. Ideally, someone who's not using AD doesn't need to understand anything about it, either as a library writer or library user, but someone who wants to be able to use it can just go ahead and use it on their existing code. And as easily maintainable is especially important for the standards committee in which we want to be able to make it such that it continuously evolves with the evolving standard. So we don't have to go rewrite or redesign everything from scratch anytime there's a standard change or a new construct that's introduced. So let's go look ahead at the three ways that this is done so far. And this is not just within C++, but we'll do a C++ focused look at these. So the first way is to be able to create your own differentiable DSL. Examples include, say, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Halide, Dubitachi, where every single operation inside of this DSL is explicitly designed to be differentiated. This is good because it allows it to be quite quick, and it guarantees that everything in the DSL works. However, in contrast, it means that you have to rewrite every single piece of your code into the DSL. And moreover, that DSL must have an operation for every type of thing you want to do. So for instance, let's look at the little code snippet below. So I use the TensorFlow C and C++ API, and I have to, if I want to go make a little softmax layer, rewrite, I can't use some existing softmax, I have to rewrite it to use all these very explicit TensorFlow operations. And in this case, I have to build up a new graph that is later executed. Some of these frameworks like PyTorch do it automatically where you don't have to build up a separate graph, but you still need to use the PyTorch specific versions of all these operations. The second common approach will be beloved by a lot of folks in the C++ community, which is operator overloading. So inside of C++, we have this tool called Adept. Inside of Python, we have a tool called Jax, where effectively what we say is let's go create differentiable versions of some existing language constructs. Now, this is nicer than the previous DSL approach where you have to rewrite literally everything, or if you have something that's sort of nicely abstracted away around those language constructs, then you can take advantage of it immediately. However, oftentimes these operator overloading approaches don't work across the entirety of the language. So especially if you have custom types or if you just have an external library or existing library that goes ahead and assumes it only works on specific types, then you may have to rewrite your code to use these non-standard utilities. So in the test case below, I have a templated version of this square function where I can either pass in a regular float64, or in this case, I can use the special differentiable a double 
that comes from ADEPT, where it will go ahead and track all the types of operations that are being run. Then when I want to go ahead and take the derivative, I say, okay, I want to take the derivative as the output, and then I want to get the, the gradient with respect to that output at the end of the day. Notably here, as is the case in ADEPT, what happens is when you go run that original forward pass version, every time you do an operation, such as this two double multiply, it will store in a separate data structure every single instruction that's being run, as well as the values that are needed to determine those instructions for the reverse pass. So effectively, we've created our own JIT, so to speak, where we've stored all the instructions as we're running it, and then we go ahead and later interpret these instructions to go compute the reverse pass. This works, but unfortunately, as you can sort of guess, creating and interpreting any type of instruction is quite slow in practice. Other versions of this, such as the one inside of JAX, don't do a dynamic storing and recomputation, but rather they actually call a just-in-time compiler directly, which then produces a binary that's run with the rest of the system. The third approach is known as source rewriting. So effectively, what we want to be able to do is we want to create some tool that takes in our source code, statically analyzes it, and produces at the end of the day a new piece of source which computes the derivative. So again, let's say we have this same square function. I run it through, in this case, the, the fastest C compatible version of it called Tapanod, which takes the code and specifies which function and what things we want to differentiate with respect to. And it produces us a new source code file that has inside of it the definition of the gradient. This can work quite fast. As we can see, this is basically what a reasonable person would write by hand. However, in contrast, it's not great for the tool because they have to re-implement the entire compiler stack. They have to re-implement parsing. They have to re-implement semantics. And this is especially hard for C++, where you have advanced features like all of those templates, classes, and what have you. And as a consequence, this source rewriter tool doesn't actually work on C++. It's limited to C only. Moreover, any time that the standard changes or there's some new utility that's added, this tool has to be rewritten to understand and keep up with that standard. Also, sort of importantly with this, it requires that all of the code that you want to differentiate, including all the libraries and all the things that we need to go through, needs to be available ahead of time. You need to know exactly what versions of these things are used, because if it doesn't have that code ahead of time, it can't find the code you want to differentiate and then produce the derivative of it. Rather than building off an existing version of these three approaches, we really want the best of a couple of these. So we want the no rewriting and the speed of the source to source AD, but we want the relatively low impact on existing code that comes with operator overloading AD. Specifically, we also really don't want that extra maintenance burden because if we want to be able to have something that's usable by everyone, it means that we need to be able to say, you don't have to rewrite every single line of C++ either because it's used as a library where someone else can use or because you want to yourself differentiate it. So the key idea here is since the compiler already implements a lot of these utilities that are used by the source rewriting AD, such as parsing and semantic analysis, what if we instead built automatic differentiation into the compiler itself, so then we can automatically keep up with all these changes without having to separately maintain a distinct parser? From here, I'm going to talk about two case studies we've done of introducing automatic differentiation into the compiler itself and the implications thereof and how we can use this as a stepping off point going forward for introducing this into a more standardized version in C++. Before I talk about these implementations of AD, let's talk exactly about the compiler pipeline as it exists currently. So first we take our standard C++ code and then using a tool like Clang, it will be lowered to some high level intermediate representation. In this case, Clang's abstract syntax tree, which directly represents the individual constructs at the source level. Clang will then go ahead and do its cogen pipeline, which then emits its internal representation LLVM, which is nice and usable for various optimizations. So we have the entire optimization pipeline written there, which will then go ahead, make it faster, produce more LLVM. And finally, at the end of the day, we'll go through the final cogen, where we'll produce an executable. So the two places that we've looked about adding automatic differentiation are either first in that immediate level, not quite source, but after the parsing and semantic analysis, the AST, which is designed to mirror what that source looks like. And we've done so using a tool called CLAD. And then the second place that we've looked at is slightly lower level. So that's that internal or intermediate representation of LLVM, 
that can coexist in that optimization pipeline, but doesn't necessarily have all of those high level directly, this comes from this exact place in source mirroring. And we demonstrate this using a tool called Enzyme. Let's look at how that first tool, Clad, works in practice. So let's take that same square example we've been using on those previous AD tools up here at the top. We run it through Clang and we get this Clang abstract syntax tree representation where we see something that directly corresponds to what our source code looks like. So we have this function square, just like before. We have the parameter double for the value, and then we see we return, and thus we return the product of these two parameters, val and val, doing the corresponding lookups, l values, r values, what have you. So now using clad, we'll take this AST representation and we're gonna create a new AST representation for a function that computes the derivative. So now we have this square dr0, which simply says we're taking the derivative of this square function with respect to the input argument. We go ahead and create a new variable as defined in AST land, that's initially set to one. And then we return the sum of that you know, shadow version of the value times the original value itself, plus in the opposite order now, the value times the shadow. Since that's a little bit hard to understand, happily, Clad has this nice utility for us where it lets us print out the C or C++ representation of the code. So we can look at that directly on the right here and see what that AST corresponded to. So we have, again, we define dval equals one. We return that eval times val plus val times dval, which gives us the equivalent of the derivative, which is just effectively two times val. So the way we would go ahead and actually go call this, and I'm illustrating this as one of several ways that can be used as an interface for both Clad and at large. The reason why it's important to think through all these different ways you might want to call it is because eventually we may want to get into the standard. So if you have thoughts or opinions on the best way to do this, let's look at all of the options you've got. So we begin by having to include this magic header file, the differentiator. We have this C++ function inside of the Clad namespace, which first takes the function we want to differentiate, as well as the R we're, we're differentiating with respect to. We have this special clad object that comes out of it that can be used in a couple of different ways. So first of all, we can just call dot execute on it with the argument we want to evaluate it with respect to. So this is the version of val. Alternatively, if we didn't like this magic function object, which notably isn't exactly a function, it's this clad high level object, we can directly call and get the function pointer out of it. And then this is just a standard function pointer we can use as a standard function. And we can go ahead and compute the derivative of with respect to. And notably, this nice high level object, the cloud object is really nice because it has a utility object that gives us a string representation of the code, which we use to print the high level representation of the derivative on the right. A couple of key insights here that are specific to cloud. It works on the either front end level, it uses the same sort of tree building approach that are similar to the C++ template instance here. The other thing that's specific to Cloud that's really nice about it, as I showed earlier, you can get a nice high level source code representation of the derivative out of it, which lets you do a lot of nice things ranging from immediately you can use it for debugging or put it inside of a separate compiler and compile it after you've extracted that code out. Having looked at how it looks at a high level, let's talk about how this might look at a low level. Even before then, let's discuss how automatic differentiation works at large. And this is in almost every single automatic differentiation tool, be it all of the existing C++ ones we described earlier, like Toponade, Adept, and even Clad, to your favorite Julia AD tool, to the Rust AD tool, to even the built into language AD tool inside of Swift. Effectively, they all work by taking the input as input code, something in that language, performing automatic differentiation on it, and then getting something similar to that language out. In the, the case of Clad, as earlier, it's, it's not exactly C++ out, it's that AST, but in the case of, say, Toponod or Adept, it's literally operating at the, the C and C++ level. Then we go through the rest of that compiler pipeline as earlier. We use the existing compiler mechanisms to lower that down to some common intermediate representation, and it, it happens to be that all of these languages all can use LLVM. We run through the optimization pipeline, and finally, we get executable, which we go ahead and run and compute our successfully generated derivative. There's a little bit of a problem here that I want to describe to everyone. Let's say we have this simple code to normalize a vector. So I have this function magnitude, which computes the magnitude of the vector, no of n time. And then I have this normalized function, which takes an input vector and an output vector, 
and then says for all of the indices, the output of that index equals the input of that index divided by the magnitude. So this will indeed successfully compute the normalized version of the sector, but it may not be necessarily the most efficient. So because we have this magnitude function inside this loop, we run an n squared time since it takes n, the loop itself takes n. Now, any good compiler works at salt will say, okay, this magnitude function is not changing between iterations of the loop. What if we just compute it once outside the loop, and then we use that same variable for every iteration of the loop? This reduces our runtime from the previous O of n squared down now to a simple O of n, a dramatic speed up. So if we then take this, and then we perform automatic differentiation after optimization, and I'm not saying this is using any particular AD tool, it can use whatever AD tool you want, just now we are doing it on the version that's already optimized. We first have the code that does that forward pass, where it does something that looks almost identical to the original function. And then we have this reverse pass, which mirrors that original piece of code, except does everything in sort of reverse order, and then generates the corresponding derivative. Finally, we have, since we have that magnitude outside the loop at the beginning, we have the grand magnitude at the very end of it. Since that grand magnitude will also take O of n time, then we can see that this entire function call will take just O of n to run in its entirety. But if we, what if we did this the other way? So we did it like all those existing tools. We can first run automatic differentiation and we'll get something that mirrors exactly what we had without that optimization. And since without optimization magnitudes inside the loop, we'll get our grand magnitude inside the loop. Then because we know we can optimize after the fact, we'll go ahead and move that magnitude outside the loop. So the forward pass now looks exactly the same as with the opposite order, with magnitude nicely outside of the loop, running an O of n time. However, the grand magnitude function is stuck inside the loop. And the reason it's stuck inside the loop is it uses this variable dres, which is computed inside the loop. And since it uses that variable defined inside the loop, we can't run loop invariant code motion since that variable is not available outside the loop. And thus, while we do indeed still have our O of n forward pass, we're stuck now with an O of n squared reverse pass, even running that optimization again. So if we look at these two pipelines in their entirety, so if we first are able to run optimization, we get the faster code, we got differentiated, we get the faster derivative. If we do this in reverse, like all the existing tools right now, we run AD, we get our reverse pass, which same runtime as the original code at that point, but optimizing it, we get stuck with the slower version because of that loop dependent variable, as in this case. But there, there's other reasons for, for more complicated cases as well. So the idea and one of the key insights behind Enzyme is that if we're able to perform AD at the low level, we can first run all the existing optimizations and then as a consequence, get that much faster code. The other little sort of interesting side note is because all of these front ends go down to the same intermediate representation, we can differentiate any of these front ends with a single tool. So looking now at exactly how this works at a low level, let's take that same square example and let's see how we can call it with Enzyme. So once again, we have the square code at the top and now we have this magic intrinsic function, Enzyme auto, which takes, in this case, a function pointer and whatever arguments you'd like. So we can define our grad square function to call the enzyme auto diff function with the function we want to differentiate followed by the arguments that we're differentiating with respect to. We run clang and subsequently the lowering and optimization pipeline in LLVM and we get the following LLVM code which again is exactly what you'd expect in the square function. So we have a floating point multiply between the two things followed by a return. We then go ahead and we use enzyme to differentiate it and now the gradient of the square function is to add the value with itself, or effectively gets two times the, the value in returning it, which is indeed the derivative and basically what you would have written by hand as a very efficient code. Moreover, if you, if you want to try this particular example out or any other sort of similar example, we have a compiler explorer instance available at enzyme.mit.edu slash explorer, and this particular case is on the, the bit.ly link there. So let's now go ahead and evaluate how compiler AD, in particular enzyme, stacks up against the two fastest AD tools. And these are the ones we talked about earlier. So we have the fastest source rewriting AD tool, Topanon, which remember only works on C code, not C++ code. 
And we have Adept, the fastest operator overloading tool. However, it's limited in terms of it, it can't run on all of the C++ code and still requires rewriting to use some of the Adept specific utilities. So we compare against those two as well as Enzyme, which first runs optimization, then the automatic differentiation, then a, a subsequent optimization pass. And we also build a version which is designed to emulate what a version of Enzyme would look like if it weren't inside the middle of the compiler, but in fact, like these other tools, did AD prior to optimization. And we call that the reference pipeline, where we first do AD before any optimization, then two rounds of OTP. And the reason we do two rounds for all of these is some of these optimizations aren't necessarily idempotent, and sometimes you can get for a matrix multiply of 30% speed up by running O2 twice. And to make sure we don't have any of those errors, we make sure all of these pipelines are the same running O2 twice. Let's take a look at how these perform in practice. So we've plotted here the relative speed up of these four AD tools with a red X to denote that it's not able to work in the case. And this, this happens for Toppenod because Toppenod doesn't work on C++ code and this Euler and RK4 test are both written in C++ in particular using the boost ODE and library. So we have three benchmarks from Microsoft's AD bench suite, that's LSTM, bundle analysis, and GMM, and we have four of generalized scientific interest, uh, two sort of integrations, a fast Fourier transform, and a Russell Rader simulation. So let's first look at our hypothesis as to how important running compiler optimizations is prior to performing automatic differentiation. And to do that, we'll look at the difference between enzyme and reference. And across the board, we get an overall speed up. On average, we get a 4.2x speed up. In, when compared against reference. And like all compiler optimizations, this doesn't necessarily evenly apply across all programs. For instance, the FFT and Brussels Reader tests were already highly optimized. So doing extra optimizations didn't really give it any extra boost. Whereas the Euler and RK4 tests, because they have to go through layers of template instantiated crazy code generated by boost, there's a huge amount of optimization potential. So you get quite a big boost and something more modest for some of these other machine learning codes. Interestingly here, looking at the true fastest state-of-the-art AD tool, Toppenod, we see that for that LSTM and bundle analysis code, it's basically the same as that reference pipeline. And, and note that you're not going to get exactly the same between Toppenod and the reference because there are some differing implementations of caches and memory allocation between Enzyme and these other tools. But to a large degree of similarity, they seem quite similar. And thus the speed up that we get of roughly a factor of two on these two test cases over both Toppenod and the reference pipeline probably can therefore be attributed to the fact that we're able to run optimizations first. Similarly, we also compare across the board to ADAPT and ADAPT also in addition has to store that instruction stack of all those dynamic memory and instructions to be able to go interpret for the reverse pass. And the act of storing that gets you a relative loss compared to some of these other tools like Topknot, which stores them directly and computes the reverse immediately. So a couple of key insights from doing it at the enzyme level or the, the, the low level is that running AD after a long side optimization enables a substantial speed up, including that 4.2x we saw in the suite of ML and scientific code, which also gives enzyme in this case, the state of the art performance compared with other tools. As a nice little sort of consequence of this, because enzyme is situated at a low level where you have all of these arbitrary inputs and all of these arbitrary outputs. It's the first tool to differentiate arbitrary GPU kernels since there's an already GPU backend after making sure that's able to handle race contention. And it's also able to work on all of the input languages, not just C++. We've also recently introduced support for generic parallelism like OpenMP and MPI, and thus anything that builds on top of these by being able to provide an implementation at the low level inside the compiler, a framework like Cocos or Raja that uses OpenMP and MPI is automatically supported. Since once you've got the primitive, anything that's built on top of it is automatically supported. Now, generalizing slightly to the key insights from both Plaid and from Enzyme to just generic compiler automatic differentiation, the most important thing to take away from here is that by using the compiler, we don't really need to rewrite that existing code to be able to differentiate it. Moreover, because we're in the compiler, which already implements parsing, semantic analysis, and what have you, we can continue to work on the input language without having to re-implement these things 
even as standards evolve, because these same parsing and semantic analyses for differing language features will already have to be implemented inside the compiler. Moreover, because the compiler inserts source line information for the sake of debugging or other errors that it could go and produce, similarly, the AD tool itself has access to those source locations and can precisely say, hey, this AD is not valid or you have an error here. We have to cache this extra value and it might be slightly slower because of this load on line three, for instance. We've also demonstrated two different ways that you can implement it. You can implement it at a high level, like inside of flag, or you can implement it at a low level inside of Ensign. And this may be faster or slower in practice. It may be harder to implement one versus the other, but this is a choice for the compiler that we've demonstrated that it doesn't matter where you want to implement it, you can implement it wherever is most convenient or you think is the best. Unfortunately, though, the one downside to doing this inside of the compiler means that to be able to do automatic differentiation, unlike an existing library approach, you need a conformant compiler. You can't just pick any compiler and then pick this automatic differentiation library. You need the version of the compiler that has support for it. And since this requires support from a conformant compiler, the immediate question that comes to mind is, can we standardize this? So then rather than just having to rely on, oh, you have a version of the compiler that is able to do this, we have a compiler that we know is guaranteed to work on my code because the standard says that it's able to. This is where we're going to end up. And we have some work inside of the C++ ML working group or SG19 to be able to ask about standardizing some of the mechanisms behind automatic differentiation. So as we've demonstrated throughout this entire presentation, differential programming and more specifically, first class support for automatic differentiation is key to C++ being able to sort of move into the future and work with all these ML and scientific use cases. Because if not, the fact that it doesn't exist inside of C++ means that you cannot have a machine learning or a scientific application like this that uses any part of C++ because they'll break the entire pipeline. Moreover, we demonstrated that compiler-based automatic differentiation really seems to be the most viable path forward. It lets us get the simultaneous set of benefits that we want out of all of those existing approaches. We get something that's able to be fast. We get something that doesn't require a rewrite of all of the code, be it inside of the STL or elsewhere. And more importantly, it doesn't require a re-implementation of all of the C++ language features to be able to do. So we have an existing paper called Differential Programming for C++ at the, the link shared there. We're talking about different things that we may want to explore in this. And if you have thoughts, feelings, or opinions on how we should go about making this best for you and your use cases, shoot us an email, come to the working group meetings, and let's take all of these things into account. So far, we've talked with folks that we know, we've sent out various emails as well as we've been talking a lot with the ML working group, but of course this may not be all of the types of folks who may want to use it. So this is why really we're coming here and we're asking, how would you want to use this? Or do you have opinions on how you think this can concretely be put into C++? So as a consequence, we're keen on being able to turn this sort of state of the art overview paper into a definitive concrete plan for making this inside of the C++ standard moving forward. So thank you all very much and uh, any questions?